This week, fighting fires, naked navigation, and a real life rocketeer. On Click, we often look out for technology which can help save people's lives. For example, we went to Rwanda to look at how drones were speeding up deliveries of blood. And recently, closer to home, I looked at how the response times of the air ambulance in London were being improved by better connectivity. If you live in the developed world, you'll probably take it for granted that you can dial the emergency number, someone will answer and help will arrive. Well, in Kenya, that's not the case. In the capital, Nairobi alone, there are more than 50 different numbers for different ambulance services. And if you need a fire engine, well, that's at least a dozen more. And even then, there's no guarantee that they'll be able to get to you. Well, Kate Russell has been to Nairobi to meet a couple of entrepreneurs who've had the great idea of amalgamating them all into one service. Think Uber for emergency services. <laughs> For most living in a modern metropolis, calling an ambulance involves dialing a single short code. But in a city of more than six million people, Nairobi has no functioning central emergency number. With five public hospitals and dozens of private hospitals and clinics all operating independently, you have to know who to call if you need an ambulance here and hope there's someone on duty to pick up. Caitlin and Maria run a startup in Nairobi, hoping to address this problem. You just take for granted that 911 exists, and we did as well. Like both of us had lived here for years and had never even considered it. And we'd worked in health, and I had never even like thought like, what would I do in an emergency? We just started asking people, you know, have you seen an ambulance before? Who has an ambulance? And we would go and meet and find ambulances in parking lots. Uh, and we started a really simple tally of like how many ambulances could we find. We kind of realized that there's so many ambulances and no one has any idea where they are. Flair's aim is to connect emergency response vehicles on an Uber-style platform that can route calls to the operator that can get there quickest. So when the call comes in, I get to know the patient location. I click on the location, get an idea of all the vehicles that are within my Ranger, I can select at our ambulance service, which is six minutes away. Now I select on the ambulance service, uh, the ambulance that I'm going to dispatch. Right. It gives me the contact number and their current location and the estimated time. And also it gives me the re direct route for them. And so you've been um, using this system through states of emergency, like yes. for example, the first election. Yeah, uh, we used it during the um, election for 2017 and um, we had uh, also a backup for the radios uh, which helped in um, the emergency services covering all the emergency situations, situations that had arisen. Uh, sorry, sorry. Leah, emergency. A busy city hospital, we left Patrick to his work and headed out onto the streets to see firsthand the traffic problems that make this kind of operator routing a lifesaver. This was especially important when violence broke out during the October elections. Flair's ambulances were 33% busier attending to emergencies in these hotspots. The response times that we've seen have gone down from 162 minutes, which is the average, which is you know, nearly three hours, which is insane, to about 15 to 20 minutes. So far, the platform has 30 ambulances online, with a goal to reach at least 50 by the end of January next year. An annual membership fee gives patients access to the emergency hotline and covers the cost of any call-outs, which otherwise would have had to be paid by credit card before an ambulance is dispatched. The fee is currently around $15 to $20, but Flair say this might change as the service matures. Eventually, Flair wants to add more concierge-style features for its members, like real-time updates and treatment information. 
The data being collected might also prove useful to help coordinate better service across the city. So one of the things that we recently learned is that there's a lack of ambulances between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. And the reason for that is that the night team is handing over to the day team. And so all providers are doing that shift change. And so then there's kind of a delay in that happening. And so then there aren't enough ambulances online to actually respond to the emergencies. So you can use that information and go to all of the providers and say maybe stagger your your times, right? Completely, or make the kind of handover process even more efficient such that that doesn't even occur. Fire means even bigger problems for emergency call-outs in Nairobi. As well as the fractured coordination issues seen with ambulances, there is a desperate shortage of both trucks and water supplies. Tragedies like this in Nairobi's vast clothes market, Gikomba, are all too common and often left burning for much longer than they should be because of a simple lack of access to resources. 999 goes directly to the police headquarters, to the police control room. So once you call the police control room, it is now there that they start looking for the nearest ambulance service or the nearest fire service. There's no radio linkage. And even the phones that they have, the phones belong to poor individuals. Fire and ambulance service are controlled separately by different players. ICT Fire and Rescue is the first firefighting school of its kind in Kenya. I went to visit them and got to try out some training. Flair is working with the school to add as many fire trucks as possible to their Nairobi coverage, as well as locating available public and private water supplies to add to the map. So there are enough hydrants in Nairobi, theoretically, uh, they were planned for, but a lot of the building, a lot of the hydrants have been built on top of. And so we are surveying Nairobi to see where are their publicly available hydrants and then where are their private hydrants that we could actually tap into. At this stage, it's unclear how the membership funding model will play out for fire cover, as call-out costs could be radically higher and more variable than ambulance work. Flair has high hopes of becoming the 911 equivalent for the whole of Kenya in the future. Kate Russell in Nairobi, solving a problem that really needs solving. And I have to say that's not always the case in the world of technology. Take, for example, smart cities, which we haven't really proved we actually need so far. But authorities in Canada have teamed up with a massive tech name to develop a smart neighbourhood that it says will massively improve sustainability and affordability. Paul Carter has been to Toronto to find out more about Google's grand designs. Google's parent company Alphabet has its fingers in many technological pies, from home automation to search to life sciences to autonomous vehicles. But now the company has an even bigger idea. It wants to build a whole new city. Well, sort of. Authorities in Canada's largest city, Toronto, have announced a partnership with Google stablemate Sidewalk Labs to design a new waterfront area known as Keyside. Sidewalk Labs say they want to see a city built from the internet up. What does that look like? The streets will come alive with a vitality that we expect from sort of the greatest urban environments in a way that has never actually been seen before. The plans include modular buildings that will automatically adapt to wind and rain, robot delivery services, underground rubbish disposal trains, heated roads to melt the snow, digital navigation systems, smart traffic, self-driving buses. So far, so Jetsons. But will any ordinary people actually be able to afford to live there? What's really interesting when you sit down with the sidewalk people is that a big, big part of what they want to do and a big part of the sort of advertisement they present for themselves is that this will lower the cost of living. Um, they're trying to find ways to reduce your cost of mobility so, for example, you don't actually have to have a car at all. These plans also rely on data and lots of it. Sensors in all aspects of the development, buildings, roads, open spaces, will measure how and when people use the environment. In a week where it was revealed Android phones were sending location data back to Google, should people be concerned about their privacy? 
They have a, a profit motive. They have a business uh, purpose for existence. Um, that you know, you have to make sure at all times that you safeguard the public interest, and that's our job on everything we do. They made it very clear that even though they are part of the Alphabet organization, which includes, they have other technologies like Waymo is their uh, driverless car uh, autonomous vehicle, they are under no pressure or no directive from Alphabet to have to use their technology. They believe that to fulfill their objectives, they want to get the best in class, the most innovative technologies, wherever they may be. Both Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs now have a year to thrash out the finer details of the plan. Anytime you do anything complicated, I was deputy mayor of New York for the six years right after 9-11. My responsibilities included the rebuilding of the World Trade Center site. You're never gonna get unanimity, um, but that's what the democratic process is all about, is kind of putting ideas out there, getting feedback, adjusting them, and ultimately, hopefully, winning over enough people that you can move forward. At the moment, this smart city of the future exists only in drawings and documents. City planners and technologists from around the world will be watching with interest to see if Google's grand plans ever make it from concept to construction. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that US prosecutors charged an Iranian man with hacking into HBO, leaking scripts for everyone's favourite TV show, Game of Thrones, and demanding over £4 million in ransom. Elsewhere, Skype disappeared from app stores in China after the government said it did not comply with the local law. The long-running net neutrality debate took another turn this week as US regulators rolled back laws that were brought in under President Obama. The chairman of the Federal Communications Commission said the changes would stop the federal government micromanaging the internet. Critics argue, however, that the changes could lead to unequal access to the internet. And humans and machine have once again been pitted against each other, this time in the battle of the drone pilots. Researchers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab set up a time trial between their artificial intelligence and drone pilot Ken Liu. Liu emerged the winner in terms of speed, but was actually less consistent overall than the AI system. And it wouldn't be click news without a robot. This fine specimen stands at 5 foot 1 and calls itself THR3. The bot is designed to mirror the movements of its human overlord and may one day be used in locations that are too dangerous for humans. That's all fine until it gets fed up and goes on strike, citing an inhospitable working environment. Earlier in the show, we saw how a smart city can be built from the ground up, but you still need to be able to find your way around it. So I've been looking at some of the latest augmented reality that aims to help. But first, I need to go and find the man who knows all about it. But he's not the only person I'm meeting. Hot Stepper is a wayfinding app that uses this scantily clad character to guide you to your designated destination. It's doing so by combining AR, geolocation data and mapping. And whilst it's not the only app to overlay directions on the real world, it certainly has its unique character. He's just doing a dance for some people who are walking past the pub. You must be Luke. Uh, yeah. Lara, good to meet you. You too. So why am I following this man around? Why have you designed him looking like this? Uh, after the year we've had in 2017, I think we all needed uh, some humour. So uh, he's just make it more interesting to get from A to B. There are a lot of navigation apps out there. Why are people going to choose this one? Some people find uh, map, uh, maps on their phones quite complicated to use. Uh, we've also put in gigantic uh, 3D arrows at the end of the road, so you can follow him and you can also see from the arrows where you want to go. There are some challenges. Um, we don't actually know where a road begins and a pavement stops, um, so we have to kind of do our best to calculate where we think that is. To make it look as believable as possible, um, what we're doing is trying to uh, find out where we think you are, uh, what the weather is like where you are, um, so if it's a sunny day or a cloudy day, uh, and then specifically the location of the sun. And if we can work out where the sun is, we can then render his shadow naturally to where it should be. 
But when you're not having fun on foot, then maybe you're trying to find a place to leave your car. Well, AR measuring app Air Measure are prototyping a function to help you parallel park. Not something you'd want any inaccuracy on. In the meantime, the app can be used for measuring furniture, creating a floor plan or seeing how tall you are. But if you're more focused on finding your way around and had taken a shine to hot stepper, just don't lose your friend or you might lose your way. OK, you can't miss that arrow, but where's my man gone? Where is he? The way we talk online has changed in the last decade. And I'm not talking about the rise of social networks like Facebook and Twitter, but the even bigger explosion in mobile messaging apps like WhatsApp, Line and WeChat, depending on where you are in the world. Since 2014, we've been using them even more than the big social networks. And with all those people spending all that time chatting rather than browsing, it's not surprising that companies are desperate to talk to us too. And that can only mean one thing, bots, chatbots, and plenty of them. Modern bots promise to connect with us and understand us in more natural ways than ever before. And that means they could potentially do more than just sell us stuff. For example, they might even change lives. Dave Lee has been looking at a unique project in Seattle which is using chatbots to help women who are working in the sex industry to stay safe. This is Aurora Avenue in North Seattle, a long straight road full of liquor stores, worn out car dealerships and cheap motels. And it's known as one of the tracks in the area and that means it's a popular place where women would come and be involved in street prostitution and men come to basically drive up and solicit for sex. As day passes into night, we see only a handful of working women walk by. Just because this street isn't as busy as it perhaps once was, doesn't mean this business has gone away. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The scale of the job to save these women who are now behind closed doors is incredibly overwhelming. Like just about every business you can think of, the sex trade is now almost completely online, powered by listings websites which do little to prevent abuses. It makes the women caught up in this dark world much less visible than ever before. I was in the life for 10 years. I had a pimp. It was very violent. I had a quota that I had to meet every day. If I didn't make that quota, like, there was punishments for that, you know. I stayed sometimes in hotels for weeks, months at a time, the same room, not leaving, maybe just to smoke a cigarette or maybe just to go to the vending machine to get a snack. In those four walls, and I can remember that, having the TV playing just so there was noise going, right? And I remember sitting in there and feeling like the whole world had forgotten about me. And what would have shifted if I would have looked down at my phone and someone said, hey, this is Jackie from Rest. I used to be in life. I have resources. Do you want to chat? Real Escape from the Sex Trade, or Rest, is a group that seeks out and helps women trapped in the sex industry. This is a centre for those taken out of the life. It's temporary, safe accommodation. The organisation is backing a new initiative developed with the help of Microsoft that uses chatbot technology to intercept anyone considering buying sex. The team places fake sex ads on popular sites. When a potential customer texts the number seeking to buy, it's a chatbot that replies. So in this case, we've set up the bot so that it's simulating a 15-year-old trafficking victim. This is just asking me questions. It's saying, how old am I? Uh, it says $100 an hour. What service am I looking for? We work with survivors of trafficking to ask them, how would a conversation like this go? What are the things that you would say? What would be tip-offs to you that this would be maybe not a bot, but maybe a law enforcement officer? It has told you that it's 15 and said, how does that sound to you? And that's where the hammer drops. And here's the message. Wow. That's a really shocking okay. feeling for someone who thinks they're anonymous, who thinks that they can go on the internet and buy another human being. Right. It's a big wake-up call. 
The bot isn't being used to arrest people. Instead, it is intended to work as a deterrent. Similar artificial intelligence technology is being used to scrape websites and reach women who may need help. Outreach comes via a text message, something that's much easier to hide from a pimp than talking to a charity worker in the street. With text outreach, we can reach so many more individuals, all of these phone numbers that we're pulling from online ads. And when a girl gets a text message, um, she can respond to it in a time and a place that's safe for her to do so. Impressed with what they've seen so far, law enforcement agencies in Seattle are now using the tech with encouraging results. There are thousands of buyers online at any time of the day or night. When we post a fake ad posing as a person in prostitution, we'll get 250 responses in the first two hours. There's no way that law enforcement has the capacity to respond to that. The chatbot allows us to connect with and deter all of those buyers online at any time. We've never been able to do that. Yet this issue needs a more permanent solution to stop websites being used to sell sex. That's what's being worked on here at the US Senate. It's time to say no more. New anti-sex trafficking measures have bipartisan support here, but some tech companies have raised concerns that the new rules could be too broad. While tech companies and legislators iron out the detail, Amanda's work in saving women continues every day. Just yesterday, I had a young woman come up to me who's living in our residential program. She comes up to me and she's like, Amanda, I have a car, I have a license, I have insurance. Like, insurance. Legit. Those are the moments that make it all worthwhile and make it seem less overwhelming because we know we're making a difference. When James Bond used a jetpack to escape the bad guys in Thunderball, the world went jetpack mad. But the US military designed Bell rocket belt that he used was later scrapped due to its high price and limited flight time. Almost 60 years on, science fiction is finally becoming science fact. Several companies and even individuals around the world have taken to the skies in recent years to show off their versions of a jetpack. And recently, I was invited to strap myself into one. Fortunately, this was only in VR. OK, here we go. We're going to go up. Oh, OK. The real thing has been built and tested by New Zealand company Martin Aircraft, which has now been bought by the Quangchi Science Company in China. First things first, technically, it's not a jetpack. It lifts off using two ducted fans which are powered by a petrol engine. It's still in testing, but the team hopes that by the time it's ready, it'll be able to fly as fast as 40 kilometres an hour at an altitude of 2,500 feet. On a single tank, it should last for about 30 minutes, covering distances of 20 kilometres, carrying about 100 kilos. And Quang Chi says it will be used for far more than just fulfilling the dream of human flight. What can we do if there are people stranded in a high-rise fire? This jetpack can reach places where a helicopter can't. A helicopter requires space, but with a jetpack, you can get very near and hose the fire down. Martin Aircraft has been developing flight technology for over three decades and previously thought it would start selling these by last year. Now the company hopes the Chinese financial boost will finally be enough to get it off the ground. Back at my VR demo, I'm starting to realise I might not be the ideal jetpack pilot. Yes, that's quite enough from us for this week's Click, but there's plenty more happening on Facebook and on Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.